Brothers and sisters, I want to start by congratulating you on your discovery of the connection between the aliveness of the food you eat and your overall level of vitality. You have made your diets more, more alive and have issued ultra-processed ultra and junk foods. Your focus on aliveness has conferred upon you immense benefits, especially in these times. If we can speak of aliveness in relation to food, can we also speak of aliveness in families and of aliveness in friendships and what about aliveness in workplaces and in schools? Beyond that, can we inquire into aliveness in society as a whole? Can we, can we ask, how alive are we as a people? A good question. And I doubt whether anyone has asked it before. It seems to me that in order to answer it, we have to consider larger and larger aspects of reality. And a lot of that is subsumed under the word economy. It encompasses everything, how we sustain ourselves, how we relate to others, and how we use our energies and intentionality to transform the material world. The economy is a living thing. It has a pulse, a metabolism, a circulation. It has cycles and rhythms. Its lifeblood is the circulation of commodities. Each day, an enormous tide of commodities circulates. The distribution of the food that we eat is a component of this great wave. And there are specialized organs, such as a factory, where commodities are produced by means of commodities. There are other organs, such as the financial system, which facilitate production, and the monetary system, which facilitates circulation. Like our bodies, this living entity is wondrous complex. The whole is sustained. Think of it, the whole is sustained by the energy and intentionality of 160 million working Americans every day. Like other entities, it too is subject to fevers, colds, and flus, and even convulsions. We call the later recessions. They remove the ex excesses built up during the expansion and reset the table for the next leg of economic growth. They perform, recessions perform the Darwinian function of weeding out the weakest. But recessions don't win elections. They are politically unacceptable nowadays. So there is as we've seen, one stimulus package after another, postponing the inevitable. But when it comes, it will be all the worse. Desperate to avoid a collapse, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, has created trillions of dollars out of thin air. It has been lending this money to banks, insurance companies and corporations. This has created an enormous stock market bubble. It has made some fabulously wealthy. Whereas for the mass of, of Americans, you have unemployment, uncertainty, insecurity, empty stores, and people living in the streets. The top one-tenth of one percent 
own as much wealth as the bottom 90%. This extraordinary polarization of wealth is without precedent in American history. Meanwhile, wages have stagnated. According to the Social Security Administration, the median uh, yearly wage in the United States is currently around $30,000 a year. In other words, 50% of all American workers make at least as much, uh, uh, as least, at least that much each year, and 50% of American workers make that much or less. Could it be that the bubbles an exceedingly slow growth over the last decade are a symptom of a deeper ill. It was America that was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. It was America that showed the world how to, pro how to mass produce everything from automobiles to television sets to even airplanes. But now we are witnessing something entirely new. The deindustrialization of America. Tens of thousands of factories have left the United States in the past decade. Millions upon millions of manufacturing jobs have been lost in the same time period. The United States has lost a whooping 32% of its manufacturing jobs since the year 2000. That comes to around 5.5 million jobs. We have shifted our manufacturing base to Asia to take advantage of cheap labor. In short, America has gone from a manufacturing economy to one based on finance, insurance, and real estate. America has made itself uncompetitive. We are simultaneously experiencing a stock market bubble, a government debt bubble, a corporate bond bubble, bubble, a real estate bubble, and a student loan bubble. The growth of total debt in the United States is incredible. Over the last 40 years, it has gone from about $2.2 trillion to nearly $60 trillion. Go into the food stores. Prices have started to rise as a result of the increased money printing. Look at the prices of organic fruits and vegetables. Inevitably, interest rates will, skyrock, will skyrocket to reflect the depreciation of the, con of the currency. The response has been one and the same, print more money. The federal government has just set a record for the biggest budget deficit in any fiscal year, $1.88 trillion. Last year, the national debt soared to $26 trillion. Just two months previously, it was $24 trillion. As one commentator has said, it took the nation 210 years to run the national debt up to two trillion, and it took exactly two months and two days to add the most recent two trillion. Tragically enough, one out of every 10 Americans is without a job. A chain reaction of bankruptcies is in the offing. As things implode, the response of the Federal Reserve will be to print more money.
It seems to us, brothers and sisters, that growing your own food is no longer an option. It is a necessity. Every backyard and intensive garden, every front yard and heirloom apple orchard, every vacant lot, a community garden, every school and edible schoolyard. In your kitchen right now, start that tray of wheatgrass, start that tray of arugula, an excellent salad green, start that tray of broccoli sprouts. We urge you to plant a victory garden. Touch the earth, it will sustain and heal you. Thank you, my privilege to be sharing some thoughts with you. Your comments and, subject, and sub suggestions are always so welcome. Let's go forward, brothers and sisters.